Hello and welcome to Lady Dynamite Creates. This is Tiffany and today I'm going to show you how I created Jinx. Since Jinx is Vi's little sister, it made sense to use a little sister body type. So I've chose Halloween here. However, Halloween has wolf ears and Jinx does not. Instead, I'm going to be using the head from this Venus doll. She has a very pointy chin just like Jinx and it's also the same sculpt that I used on Vi. To start getting these prepped for their swap, I first shave down all of their hair. I use my electric razor to get it nice and short. Now I've boiled some water and I'm going to plop both dolls down in there. I'm going to let them sit for a couple of minutes so that vinyl gets nice and squishy. Then using a towel to protect my hands because this is hot, hot water, I'm going to gently pull off the heads. Using my flathead screwdriver, I'm going to scrape out the hair plugs from the inside of the Venus head and then use my needle nose pliers to pull all of those plugs out. With 100% acetone, I remove all of the factory paint and the flocking. Since I am using a little sister body type, they have smaller heads than the standard Monster High dolls, so I am going to need to shrink this head a bit. And I'm using the fast shrinking method, so I drop my head down into a glass jar, and if you notice, I'm using one of the wide mouth jars because I want to make sure that the opening is wide enough that I'm not having to really mangle the head trying to pull it out of the jar. But I fill it up with acetone, making sure the head is nice and covered, and I'll leave that for two hours. Now that this has been in the acetone for two hours, I'm going to remove it, and it is very slippery and jiggly, so it is a little tough to get out, but I make sure to drain out as much of the acetone as possible from the neck hole, and then I leave it to sit for a little while. It takes about 48 hours for the head to completely shrink up and harden. However, I want to reroute this head, and I do want to do it before it gets so hard that I just can't reroute it anymore. So after about 12 hours, I'm taking and I'm going to coat the scalp with some paint, and then I'm going to start my reroute. I plan to rewrote her with this blue glow in the dark hair from the doll planet. It's actually light activated, so wherever the light has shined on it, it glows brighter. I thought that it might make for some cool effects during her photo shoot. I rewrote her in my normal fashion, looping the hair around my finger and then sliding the hair onto the needle head and tightening. I plunge the needle down into the pre-existing holes and I make sure when I'm doing the hairline that the two prongs of the needle are perpendicular to the line of holes. If you're in line with the holes, what happens is each prong from the needle goes into a different hole. And when you plunge it down in there, it rips the vinyl. And if you do this enough times, it can split the whole scalp. Jinx has a widow's peak, but there are no holes in the Venus sculpt for that, so I needed to create some. I plunged the needle down into the hole, marking the first point where I want it to be the deepest, and then I just fill those areas in until it's nice and full. No pre-punching holes, just stabbing away. For the center part, I've marked where it should be with a pencil, and then I've plugged hair all along that line. I pull that hair to one side, and now I'm going to go back in, and I'm going to plug hair into those exact same holes, but this time I'm pulling it in the opposite direction. This is going to create a nice, neat part line for us. I'm completed with the reroute, but you can see I've only rerouted a couple of lines right there next to the hairline. Jinx has very thin braids, and I don't want these to get bulked up too thick, so I'm leaving this huge bald spot. For now, I'm just going to section this hair away, and then I'm going to secure all those plugs with some liquid fusion glue. I swirl the glue around with a Q-tip, making sure that I touch all those plugs, just making them nice and secure. I trim her neck peg down since we're working with a shrunken head. I think it needed to be a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to pop her head onto her body. Normally, I would wait until the glue dried and after the face up to put the head back on. But since this is a shrunken head, I was really worried that if I waited much longer, it just wouldn't happen. I let her sit for another day and a half to let her vinyl get a little bit harder. Now, using my X-Acto blade and my Dremel, I can start shaping out and carving her face. Something I did notice about the shrunken heads is whatever feature the doll has is going to become a lot more pronounced once the head has been shrunk. For instance, the little indentions at the corners of the mouth were very deep after the shrinking, the tip of the chin was a little bit more squared, and the cheekbones were much more sharp. I did notice that working with this shrunken head that the ears were harder to carve than on the non-shrunken head, and I don't know if it's because the shrinking made the veining in the ears more pronounced, or if it was something else entirely. I will say the shaping of the jawline was much easier on the shrunken head though. When I start shaving these areas down with my Dremel, I'm starting with a 120 grit on the Dremel itself, and then I go in with passes of hand sanding at much higher grits, 320 and up, and I finish it off with a buffing block to get the vinyl back to smooth. Now 
Now on to her clothes. The patterns for the capris and the razorback tank are available for free for my patrons tiered cherry bomb and up. The link is in the description box below, so go check it out. With right sides facing, I sew up the front seams, so and once that's in place, I fold down and hem the top edge. I sew up the back seam to the marked edge, this way they can still fit over her hips. I sew up and around the legs and crotch. To attach the Velcro, I'm taking the hook side and I'm letting it hang off the edge forming a tab. Then I'm going to just sew one side of that down. For the loop side, I'm making sure that it hits at the very edge of the other side of the fabric. Now when you fold over the fabric and close it, the two sides just butt up against each other and it keeps it nice and flat. For her tank top, it wound up being a pretty simple build and it worked the first time I made it so I don't have that footage, but I just sewed up the side seams and attached the Velcro. I marked where the eyelets needed to be for her little lace-up detail there, and then I started setting them. I used my awl to create a hole in the fabric, and then I set the eyelet down into that hole and set it with the setting tool. The setting of these decorative eyelets was much easier than the last time I did the lace-up ones. It's like they're trying to trick me to make me keep using them. I use faux leather strips for the decorative lacing. Then I've 3D printed a belt buckle and I'm going to lace this up with some faux leather strips that I've painted gray. And I just slide that through the belt buckle, tack it down with some super glue, and then do this to the other side. However, on the other side, I'm making sure that tab goes on the outside instead of the underside. And we're going to add some nail art embellishments to make it look like the tab of a belt. I secure this to the edge of the fabric with a bit of super glue. Then I cut off any excess. Now on to her shoes. It's been a hot minute since I've made any warbler shoes and since she needed combat boots, I thought it was about time I did. I previously made a pattern by wrapping up her foot in some masking tape and then just sketching out my design. When my pattern pieces are ready, I can cut those out and start applying them. I start with the sole of the foot and I've made sure to wrap her foot up with some cling film because warbler will stick to the plastic. Next, I'm heating up the area that is the toe and the tongue of the boot. I'm just heating that up with my heat gun and applying it to her foot, making sure to pinch those edges against the sole. When the warbler gets a little bit too cold to be pliable, I will hit it with my heat gun. I'm careful to not leave it on there too long because I don't want it to adhere to that plastic wrap. Next, I can apply these two side pieces and finally the toe. Before I move on to adding in more layers, I'm going to add in some of these impression details. I'm using my sculpting tools to help define the stitching lines and the holes for the shoelaces. With all of my impression stitching in, I can now add in the rest of those details like the wraparound cuff of the boot, the folded down portion of the top, the final sole, and the heel piece. I need my next doll to definitely be an easy one. These last two have just been a little bit crazy. This one, not as bad as Vi, but... During the middle of the process here, my dishwasher stopped working five days before Thanksgiving. And not only did it just stop working, it stopped working because it started leaking. Apparently it had been leaking for some time and we just didn't know it because it was leaking and then going underneath our floating floors. And we just didn't know it until it started seeping up through the floorboards. Yeah. And I have water damage all over my kitchen now that I'm going to have to deal with for the rest of the holiday season. Yay!
My favorite part of the construction of the boot was cutting these very thin little strips of Vorbla and heating them up and making the shoelaces with them. They were so cute. Once the shoes were complete, I gave them a coat of Flex Bond Primer for Warbla and then got them painted. On to her weapons. This time around, I was super burned out from all of the 3D modeling I had to do on Vi and I just, I couldn't go through that again. <laughs> this time I'm using a free model of fish bones and a purchase model for the Zap Gun. And if you're interested to see how I turned this very faceted model into a usable model for 3D printing, go check out my Patreon. I'll show how I do it over there. I have now imported fish bones into LaJ Slicer and you can see it's nice and smooth now. I've scaled it to the approximate size that I think we will need for this doll and I'm getting it ready for the supports. I use my Light J Slicer magic button and it automatically puts supports for me. And then I do an auto arrange for everything that's on the build plate. However, I'm not happy with the way those supports are laid out. So I'm gonna try it again just to see if I get something more usable. It happens to be this time I did. If I didn't get anything in a position that I was happy with, cause I generally like to have my supports be on the underside if possible. I don't like them to be on the top and on the fronts where you see them most. I like them to be underneath where they're least noticeable. If I hadn't have gotten that, I would have reoriented fish ones myself, then turned off auto orientation. It would have kept the position I put it in and then added supports to that. With the supports added now, I go and scrub through my layers and any area that is a first time it's touching the build plate with it not attached to another bigger area, I am thickening up and making those supports a little bit stronger. When I'm done, I export my file and bring it over to my printer and get it started printing. After it's finished, I noticed I'm having some areas that pulled up. I had a misprint in the middle here and it did turn out I did need to change out my FEP on this. So after this print, I had to go in and change that before I print it again. I pry this off of the build plate and I drop it down into my alcohol and I'm using 91% alcohol here and just getting them nice and cleaned up. And then I'm going to remove all of the supports and pop it in here for two minutes to cure under the UV lamp. I do really love how these prints turned out. They are really nice. And while they're not exactly like how the new fish bones looks for the arcane skin, I did a few modifications to get these a little bit closer to that. They do need to be sanded down. So I am just sanding at some of those areas where the supports previously were and getting it nice and smooth. I'm gonna be leaving a link in the description box on where you can find the original fish bones and the zap gun. This zap gun was modeled so beautifully. I'll also add a link into the altered fish bones that I created. Now onto the painting. I start just getting everything based out in colors. The metallic paints that I use tend to be a bit more sheer, so I like to give them an undercolor that's very similar to the color that they will be. So silver is gray, gold is kind of a yellowy gold color. With all of those painted, I can add in the small details, and then I start hitting up my base colors with their metallics. I wanted to say a big thank you to all of my patrons over on Patreon, OOAK Magpie, and Bex Mini Studio. If you're interested in becoming one of my patrons, please check out the link in the description box below. They get to see pictures of the dolls as I'm working on them, as well as free patterns and exclusive videos. Lots of other stuff too, so check it out. Finally, I finish that off with a wash of black and I just slather that stuff on and then wipe away the excess. The final thing I paint are the paint splatters.
With the zap gun and fish bones complete, I can now move on to the doll. I was running low on Mr. Super Clear, so I decided to do my skin tone change with my airbrush instead of pan pastels. To achieve a skin tone, I'm mixing up equal parts of red, blue, and yellow, and I add a bit more yellow or red or blue here as I'm going just until I get a tone I'm happy with. And then to lighten it up to the color I want, I'm adding in copious amounts of white. I thoroughly mix this, and then when I'm happy with the color, I pop it into the airbrush and get painting. I'm using a dual action airbrush for my painting and that means it has a separate control for airflow and for paint flow. This allows me to not to put quite so much paint on at once and allows me to spray a bit of paint and then dry it with the air. This keeps me from getting too much paint build up at once and having drips and runs. Sorry about this camera angle guys, I'm still trying to figure out a way I can record airbrushing without my hand being in the way and also without coating my camera in paint. With the color change complete, I prep her with a couple of coats of Mr. Super Clear and can get started with the body blushing. I completely cover her with a layer of pastel. This color that I'm using is similar to the color that I painted her with. This is going to allow for smoother blending when I go in and add those darker colors. Sometimes if you don't do this, going in with a darker color will look patchy. I'm darkening up areas that would naturally be in shadow and I'm using highlights to pull up the raised areas. I'm just trying to accent the molding that's already there. Once I've finished all of the body blushing, I give her a couple of coats of Mr. Super Clear and then I begin on her tattoos. I have a reference sheet close by that I can refer to making sure that I get the placement for her tattoos correct. I first sketch it in with a gray watercolor pencil and when I'm satisfied with that, I do the dark blue outline. I use wet q-tips and brushes to help clean up any stray pencil marks. With all of my blue outline in place, I can fill in the light blue of the clouds. Now onto the face up. As you can see, I have previously wiped off another layer already, so this is my second try at this face up. I got started on that first layer and realized I was just hating the way it was looking, and rather than seal it and just try to correct as I went, I knew that if I in the end got too far along and really hated it still, I was going to have to recolor her and everything, and I didn't want to have to bust out the paint again and paint her. The first thing I do is define that eye shape and I'm using a dark gray on the top and then I'm using a pink to draw in the bottom water line. I did do the iris shaping right away. Uh, one of the things that I felt like I was struggling with the last time was the placement of the irises and the size, so I wanted to knock that out right here and make sure I liked it first. Once I'm satisfied, I can begin with some of the shading around the face. And I start in right around the eyes and I'm doing some dark smoky grays, but I also wind up bringing in some more uh, lively peach colors to shade this out. All right, here's your spoiler warning, guys, if you haven't already watched the final episode of Arcane. I wanted Jinx to have a very pale gray skin tone with just hints at some peachy colors here and there. I figured she's living in Zon, which is the Undercity. They don't really see a lot of light. What little bit of light they do is very filtered and just trying to get through all those layers of dirt and grime and smog. Plus, I had already decided I wanted to do Jinx Post Shimmer so that she had the purple eyes. And I, I feel like there would be some kind of chemical reaction there because in her original skin, she is very pale and grayed out. I sketch out the eyelid crease and then I go in with a white watercolor pencil and start hitting up some highlights. I'm highlighting up the brow bone and right around the tear duct. I highlight the under eye creases and the top of the cheekbones to give the eyes a little bit more sunken in feeling. I blend all of these lines out just a bit with my q-tip. I ring the outside of the irises with a dark pink. I push the highlighting even further using some white pastel and a light blushing of pink to the cheeks. I dust some mauve pastel onto the lips and block in the color for the irises.
The last thing I do on layer one is add in some red to the corners of the eye. Now it's the start of layer two, so the first thing I do is to find my eyebrows. I do a little bit of playing around trying to find the right eyebrow shapes that I was wanting, and I decided in the end I wanted to have one extremely arched and one just flat out like she's smirking at you. And I use my pencil eraser to clean up those eyebrows. I did try to upturn one side of the mouth just to make that smirk even more pronounced, but the shrinking of the head caused those dimples at the corners of the mouth to be way more pronounced than they normally are, and it just fought me too much and in the end just never looked right, so I erased it. At least next time I know that's something that needs to be carved in on a shrunken head. I added in her pupils and then pushed the contrast on the eyes a bit more, and I'm filling in the scleras of her eyes with some white watercolor pencil. I'm looking back at this footage now, I just want to scream at myself, go sharpen your pencil. I'm using a brown watercolor pencil to give that bagging under the eyes some more depth. I add some shading to the sclera and the top of the iris. I use a brown watercolor pencil to give some detail lines to the lips, and then I go over that with a dusting of pastel to soften them up. The final thing I do on layer two is darken up the nostrils. On layer three, I start with detailing the eyes further and then adding the individual hairs to the eyebrows. With a very sharp black pencil, I add in her eyelashes. I'm making sure to do these in quick light flicks so that the lash has a natural taper to it. I brighten up the bottom portion of the whites of the eyes and then I use my white watercolor pencil to highlight the top of the lashes. Using white gouache, I paint in her catch lights, and then I add some lighter highlights to the tear duct and around the water line. I use a light brown watercolor pencil to darken the corners of the eyes where the eyeball meets the water line. Now with the face up complete, I can give her a couple of coats of Mr. Super Clear to seal in all of that work. I've removed her hair from the wrap and I'm going to address the area right around the edge of her hairline that had the overspray of sealant and pastels. I just take my fingernail and I scratch at the hairline just a bit and this just pulls up that sealant. I'm so sorry about how dirty my hands look. It's paint, I swear. It was after I did my washes on fish bones. To style her hair, I've got it sectioned out into the three sections, and I'm taking the two pieces that are made to be her pigtails, and I'm pulling them into low pigtails that hit just at the base of the neck. I'm wrapping those up with a clear plastic band, and then I am doing just a simple braid. I do really wish I would have just done the hairline reroute, and then maybe just glued some hair directly to the head, just to cover in that space so that it looked like there was hair there, because even with doing as little rerouting as I did, I felt like these braids were just a tad too thick for the look that Jinx has. Once the hair's completely braided, I use some strips of leather to hide those plastic rubber bands. Now to create that iconic front bang swoop. I didn't have a curler that was big enough, so what I did instead was take four of these foam wire curlers and just twisted them together. Then I wrapped the hair around this and I set it with a piece of tape just to keep it in place. Off camera, I pour some boiling water on this to set it. Once dry, I remove it, and then I have a nice big curl there. I 
I use my scissors to trim it down to length and then I style it with a bit of hairspray. So that the bangs don't end at a blunt angle, I'm taking the scissors and cutting at an angle and I'm also sliding them down as I cut. This will give the hair a nice natural taper. I spray the hairspray directly to my fingers and apply it that way because I don't want to get it on the doll's face. Finally, the last thing to do is just get her dressed. At the time the video goes live, Jinx will be available for sale on my Etsy store. I'll leave a link in the description box below, so if you're interested, check her out. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, and if you want to see more, please subscribe to the channel. Remember, always be creating!